Hi guys, welcome to the latest podcast of Yarn and Black. Today I've got a really get, special guest speaker on, Nathan Lovett Murray. But before I introduce him, I just want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that I'm currently on. I'm calling in from Borman Q on the land of the Rundry people, and I'd like to pay respect to their elders past, present, and the future leaders that are going to help guide us into the future. And I want to pay respect to any Aboriginal person that's joining us today, and including Nathan. So hi, Nathan. Hi, AJ. How are you? Cool. So before we start, um, just tell us a little bit about who you are and where you're from. Yeah, no, I grew up in a small country town, a uh, place called Haywood, which is in um, southwest Victoria, down near Portland Warrnambool Way. Um, that's my mother's country on the Lovett side, so connected to Gundy Jamara. Um, yeah, grew up there until I was uh, 18 and you know, moved to Melbourne uh, for football, and I've been in sort of back and forth from Melbourne ever since, and um, you know, on my dad's side, um, I'm connected to Yorta Yorta, Wamba Wamba, uh, Judaroa and Jaja Rung as well. Yeah. So where did you grow up the most? Where did you go to primary school? Yeah, well, we, we moved around a bit when I was younger. So um, you know, I started school in, in Portland and then went to Hayward, um, went to Moama, lived up there for a bit and then um, went to Shepparton Primary School, Gary Street. So I was up there for a couple of years and then um, Haywood was always home, so would always you know move away, but then you know, come back to Haywood and you know did all my high school in at uh, Haywood um, High School. Yeah, cool. And you've got a you you actually got a really big family. How many brothers and sisters do you have? Yeah, big family. Um, me, me dad's got twelve kids. Uh, there's six boys and six girls, and I think I'm the third oldest in that family. And uh, yeah, my mum's had the the four kids to the old man and. Um, yeah, so I've got the four brothers that I, uh, two two brothers and uh, one brother and two sisters that I grew up with in Haywood. Yeah, and um, how old were you when you decided you wanted to play footy? Oh, look, when I was growing up, you know, primary school, I, I always wanted to be a basketball. I loved the NBA, and you know that was always my dream of playing NBA basketball. And I was a big fan of you know, Michael Jordan and Shaquille O'Neal. And um, but then I guess I got to the age of, of 15, 16 and you know, I was playing cricket football, basketball, you know, as you do in country towns. And, um, you know, I, I, made, I had to make a decision and, um, you know, I decided to choose football. And, you know, I, I remember going to Richmond Football Club on an Indigenous leadership camp and, and meeting Phil Egan, who, who was also an uncle, and he played 100 games at, at Richmond. And, you know, he taught us about goal setting and, and following your dreams. And I reckon that was the time when I decided to, you know, I wanted to play AFL. And, uh, you know, from there, I just wanted to, to play AFL. So I ended up um, playing with North Ballarat Rebels in the under-18s and Hayward to Ballarat was a three-hour drive. So we used to have to travel up there a fair bit and um, put my name into the draft and end up um, getting asked to do a pre-season with Richmond Tigers. Did that for a couple of months when I was 18, then ended up getting drafted to Collingwood on the rookie list. Um, spent the one year there, just played in the VFL after that, I got delisted and played a couple of years in the, the VFL with Williamstown and, and Bendigo Bombers. And I remember I, I travelled up to Darwin and played some footy with um, some mates at, for St Mary's. And that was a club where the famous Michael Long played. And I remember meeting Longy up there and, um, you know, talked about wanting to play AFL. And then I guess through that connection, you know, he was able to get me the Michael Long scholarship and play with Bendigo Bombers. And from there, I was drafted to Essendon Bombers. And you know, I spent 10 years there and 145 games, I think, and life member. So, you know, had a, had a really good time there and lots of great memories. Yeah. What What is one of your favourite memories of, of working of working there? Oh, uh, look, I Playing. think, uh, yeah, I think my highlights of, of my football career, um, I didn't get to play in any AFL grand finals, but I got to play in the Dreamtime game. Um, you know, that was always a highlight. I guess I played in the first one and, Played in a few of them and, you know, playing in those Dreamtime games, it was an opportunity to, you know, represent your culture, your, your mob, your tribes. And I remember one game, I reckon I, I had about 200 tickets that I gave away to, to family and, and friends. So, you know, running out onto the MCG, 95,000 people and knowing that all your families in, in the crowd, you know, that was something that you know, really gave me goose, goosebumps to be able to you know, represent my mob, you know, in those Dreamtime games. And, and also playing in the Anzac games as well, sort of knowing... You know, my family history with, with the Anzacs, uh, my great grandfather Frederick Lovett served in World War One and you know, in World War Two we had he had his four brothers serve in that and return alive. So, you know, the five Th Lovett brothers served in that. And then from that family line, I think we've had over twenty family members that have served in every sort of war that Australia's been in. And um so, you know, there's a bit of that that significance, um, you know, playing in Anzac Day and what it represents and I guess you know, represent my family on that side as well was always a highlight. And I guess being delisted by Collingwood, 
you know, I always wanted to be, wanted to play well in the Anzac Day games and, you know, a couple of games I, I played okay, which I was, um, you know, pretty you know, significant as well. Yeah. What was your, um, what was it like having, like, young people look up to you while you're playing foot footy? Yeah, I think, you know, I guess, you know, from an early age, like, I knew I was a role model and, you know, young people looked up, looked up, up to me, so... You know, it's just about, I guess, setting a good example, you know, healthy lifestyle. Um, you know, and just, I guess, you know, my important message to young people is just follow your dreams. You know, like, um, you know, I was a, a young, skinny, black black kid from from Hayward and, you know, I didn't didn't know that I was going to be able to achieve what I achieved, but I just, I guess I believed in myself and, um, you know, and I was able to achieve my dreams of, of playing AFL football, you know, for 10 years. And, um, you know, and it, it showed me that, you know, dreams do come true and, and you know, you just got to believe in yourself. Yeah, well, you you did surprise one young fan who was actually my son, who um, wrote you a letter. Um, he had dyslexia or he had learning disorder growing up, so it took him a while to write the letter, and you actually sent him back your training top. Yeah, uh, I, I think I briefly remember it, and um, you know, I used to have a lot of uh, you know Essendon memorabilia and. You know, training tops and jumpers, and yeah, you know, they're all gone now. Yeah, you know, a lot of friends and family have yeah. sort of claimed them, and yeah, you know, we always like to look after our bomber fans. Yeah, so he's still got that shirt, and he did ask me if he gets it, if I get a chance to catch you, can you sign it at some stage? Yeah, mate, would have, wouldn't happy to. I will. I'll, I'll arrange that. Um, who who have been some of your role models? Yeah, I think yeah, you know, growing up as a kid, yeah, you know, I was very lucky. Um, my mum had I think five brothers, and you know, my uncles that I. I looked up to as, as um, you yeah, know, they all played sport, basketball, football and cricket. And so, you know, they really helped with my development in sport. Um, and then I guess as I got older, you know, really sort of helped, I guess, with the life skills and, and I guess teaching me how to be a man. Um, you know, my father was also a, a hero of mine. You know, he, was, he was a pretty good footballer, Gary Murray. Um, you know, so he was also another big support. And I think, you know, as I got older um, and, and watching the AFL, you know, I was a North Melbourne supporter you know, growing up and Wayne Carey was one of the best players going around. So, you know, it was someone that I, I really looked up to as well. Yeah. How do you how do you define eldership in community? Oh, look, I think it's, you know, life experience and it's, it's um, I know for myself, you know, whenever I go through a difficult time or stressful time, you know, I'll go back home and, you know, I'll talk to my elders and, and just get that advice. And, um, you know, I always go back home to talk to my nan, you know, Annie Laura Bell. And, you know, she's been a, you know, a rock, I guess, in, in my life, you know, someone that's always been there and, and just, you know, always got those, I guess, kind words and positive words that you need, you know, when you do go through those difficult times. And, you know, elders, are, they're like a library and, you know, we need to use more, use them more, I, I believe. And, you know, they play a significant role in our culture and it's something that, you know, needs to be really sort of, you know, they need to be looked after and, you know, treated as such. Yeah. Now, you also won the Victorian Indigenous Emerging Leader Award. I'm not sure what year it was. What year was did you get yours? Oh, look, I reckon it was, um, might have been 2009 or 10. Yeah. It's, it's going back a bit. It was, um, it was around a time I was actually, I'd, I'd set up my own Indigenous hip hop record label, Payback Records. Yeah. and. You know, it was about giving a voice to young Indigenous um, people to, um, you know, express themselves through hip hop music, and um, you know, through that uh, emerging leader um, award, I was able to uh, support, um, you know, some young artists, young warriors, and um, was able to do uh, like a national tour around the country and it, uh, supporting a, a rock band, Coloured Stone, who had the, you know, the classic hit Black yeah. Boy, and. You know, to be able to, I guess, give other people opportunities, that's something that, you know, I'm really passionate about. Yeah. We hear the term reconciliation all the time, and I know it's sort of come back since the referendum, but what does reconciliation mean to you? Uh, I think it's about actions. Um, I think, you know, we talk about it a lot and, you know, we've got the reconciliation action plans and I've been involved in a, a few of them with my role at Essendon. I think we were, Essendon Bombers, we were the first sporting club to, to have a wrap and, um, I, I think, you know, it's about organisations and, and people in general just, I guess, showing that they care and, um, you know, that, that's what's important and just you know, actions speak louder than words. You know, we're not just talking about it, but we're actually, you know, we're walking it as well. Yeah. I, I quite like that. And it's about walking together, isn't it? Yeah, I think that's really important about listening and, 
you know, listening to Indigenous people, you know, we have the oldest living culture in the world. It's something that, you know, we're proud of and, and you know, we want to protect. And, you know, I guess how can other businesses, organisations, you know, partner with other Indigenous groups that are already doing the work and, and, and supporting them? So I think that's, you know, extremely important. Yeah. Did you ever face racism on the field as a player? Oh, look, I, um, I yeah, I did in a... Um, yeah, at school and, and also in a, in a VFL game, not so much in an AFL game, but I do know, you know, there was a bit of a in the crowd, um, you know, and it's something, you know, I actually produced a, a documentary called The Ripple Effect, you know, it's about Indigenous athletes and multicultural athletes that have been through racism and how it impacted on their mental health. And, you know, it's a big story about Nikki Wimmer, but you know, I also share my story on there. And, you know, I think you know, it does have a big impact on your mental health, you know, going through racism and, um, you know, but I've always been a big believer. You have to call it out. Um, you know, get on the front foot. But in saying that, you know, we need more allies. You know, we need more indigenous, non-indigenous people. You know, helping with calling racism out and you know, putting a stop to it because you know it's just so important. You know, we don't want our young ones. You know, I've had my my children go through racism, and it's just it's not a good feeling. It, it does impact impact you, you know, mentally, physically, and spiritually. And it's um something that you know we have to keep calling out and. Um, you know, put a stop to. Yeah. Now, you mentioned the word ally. What makes a person a good ally? Oh, look, I think, you know, a good ally, um, you know, I've got some great friends that are allies and, you know, they just listen and, and they understand, um, they care um, and they, they get involved and, and, you know, they're, they're not scared to have those conversations and, and, and want to learn more about Indigenous culture and, um, you know, and, and um, you know, Indigenous people and just having those conversations and, um, you know, getting to know them. And, um, you know, I, I had the opportunity to work at Brighton Grammar, um, you know, as an Indigenous mentor and, you know, to, to be able to work with them and, and see how the school and, and, you know, the teachers, you know, were really, um, you know, really keen to get behind in, about learning about Indigenous culture. And, you know, I remember we did some trips up to uh, Tiwi Islands um, you know, we took some staff up there, some students up there. We did some cultural immersion camps. And then, you know, we had the opportunity to take um, the, the students and staff down to Lake Conda, down onto my country. And, um, you know, and that's something that, you know, I was, I was something really proud of to be able to, you know, educate, you know, non-Indigenous people about our culture. And, you know, sometimes there's a bit of a perception here in Victoria that there's no Aboriginal culture here, but, you know, it's very strong. And, and you know, we're proud of our culture and we're proud to showcase it and, and protect it as well. Yeah. You got some events coming up as well. So you've got the healing ceremony. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, look, um, I've started a business, Indigenous Sports Networks, and it's an uh, event and sports management um, company. Um, you know, through my experience with the record label, I've, I've been able to use that, and I guess my networks. And um, last year, I started it twelve months ago, and you know, we did a healing ceremony last year, the Nagara Jara Noun healing ceremony. It was an event. Last year for Nicky Wimmer, it was a tribute to his 30-year anniversary when he stood up to racism at, at Vic Park. And um, we're putting on another one this year on April 21st on a Sunday um, in partnership with the Collingwood Football Club. Um, you know, we're going to have 10 Victorian traditional dance groups perform a healing ceremony. Um, it's going to be a tribute for the Rumbalara and Fitzroy Stars Football Netball Clubs. I've, I've had involvement at both those clubs and coaching and playing. And you know, I've seen the racism that, that goes on there and um, and I guess I see how it gets swept under the carpet about uh, under the carpet. So, yeah, you know, I'd like to sort of shine a spotlight on those two clubs, you know, to support them, um, but also look at you know providing that healing space, you know, not not just for the clubs but for the general community to to get involved in this ceremony. Yeah. Um, what else does your business actually do? Uh, yeah, look, it's um, yeah mainly focus on event and sports management. So. I've uh, been managing a, a couple of sports people, Jack Paris, um, who's, um, who was at St Kilda for a couple of years. I had a bit of a mentoring role with him, with my role at, at St Kilda, but now um, he's, he's at Essendon in the VFL. And then also managing a young Indigenous uh, girl, Marissa Williamson-Polman, who's disqualified for the Paris Olympics in boxing. She's the, the national Ooh. champ for her weight division, 66 kilos, and she's only been boxing for about a few years. And she trains down at the Collingwood Youth youth um, club down there and um, has made some really big progress in her, her boxing career. And, um, yeah, I think she's the first Indigenous boxer to qualify, female boxer to qualify for the Olympics. So, you know, she's got, um, you know, a lot of talent and, you know, we're looking to support her and hopefully, you know, she can go to Paris and win a gold medal. And, um, you know, after that, who knows what the future can hold. Yeah. 
that's so good that you've always kept that mentoring role. Um, you're, you're kind of like a born mentor. Yeah, look, I, I, I know how important mentors are because I reckon that's, that's what helped me get to where I am and I've had some really great mentors when I was younger and um, I remember you know, having people like Michael Long and Dean Rioli you know, when I was playing AFL you know, become mentors for myself and, and help my journey so much and then I played that role for the younger Indigenous players that were playing at Essendon at that time and then um, you know, having, I guess, coaching experience with Rumbelara and Fitzroy Stars, I understand you know, the importance of mentoring. Um, you know, I set up a mentor program at, at St Kilda Football Club and you know, we had the um, mentoring young Indigenous players in our Next Generation Academy and you know, a couple of them got, got drafted, you know, Jack Paris being one of them. Um, so, you know, I've always been passionate about mentoring and just, I guess, understanding the importance of, you know, a, a positive mentor can, you know, help so many young people and, um, you know, just help, I guess, keep them on track and keep them focused on their goals and their dreams. Yeah. Now, at school growing up, how much Aboriginal studies did you actually learn at school? Uh, look, I look, I remember going to primary school and, you know, learn, learning about Captain Cook being the first person in the country and, I remember also yep. at that age, you know, my uncles used to take me out to Aboriginal sites around Lake Conda of, of stone huts and eel traps that were nearly 10,000 years old. So, you know, I guess I was lucky to, I guess, have a, a true um, education, understanding about my culture and, you know, that was taught to me by my family. And um, I think, you know, the, the schools, have, I guess, have gotten better in that space. I, I know now that in that primary school down Hayward, they teach Gundi Jamara language and... Um, I guess having that experience also working at a school like Brighton Grammar where, you know, we, I think at one stage we had about 12 Indigenous students, you know, a lot of them from remote communities, you know, attend that school and, um, you know, they wanted to, I guess, get better in that space and, and, and learn and, you know, do these trips, you know, out to, um, you know, remote communities and, you know, Aboriginal sites. Um, so, you know, we've still got a little bit, you know, to go in, in that space and, and I guess making the kids feel culturally safe um, is is important, you know, to, to keep the kids happy, you know, in that environment. So that's something that I think, you know, schools need to work on. But also, you know, dealing with racism, you know, I've you know, gone through some experiences with my own daughter, you know, experienced racism at, at six, seven years old and sort of had to go through yeah. that process. And, you know, it wasn't a good feeling, you know, having to deal with the school who was probably trying to sweep under the carpet a bit. But, you know, we called it out and I guess put them on notice to do better and, and you know, to the credit they have, you know, in, in some areas. So... I think, you know, with, with, I guess, you know, the schools and that, it's, it's you know, they, I, I guess they are trying, um, but, you know, they've just got to listen to, you know, the Indigenous people, you know, the communities about how to do things better. Yeah. Do you think that schools are improving, though? Do you think there is a big improvement or do you think it's plateaued a bit and uh, needs a bit more of a push? I think it's baby steps. I think, you know, I look at my yeah. son's, um, you know, cultural education, you know, compared to mine and, you know, he's, he's learning a lot about his culture, um, Aboriginal culture, you know, at his school. And, and it's mainly from going on those trips out on country. And that's where you get the real education. You know, sometimes it's not always in a classroom. You know, it's, it's about getting out there and, you know, visiting the communities, visiting, you know, Aboriginal people. Um, you know, it's always good having Aboriginal people come in to teach education. That That's also important as well. And I know, you know, with yourself, you've, you've done some work with Brighton Grammar and, and the boys out there and, uh, that was probably the first time, you know, those students had been involved in, you know, Aboriginal dance and, and culture at their school. So I think, um, you know, the schools probably need to, you know, engage more with, you know, Indigenous people that, that work in that space. And, you know, that, that's something that's, you know, really important that we need to keep pushing. Yeah. Now, if I could give you a zillion dollars and a magic wand and said you can fix something in Indigenous affairs, where would you start? Uh, I think it's um, you know, working in that Indigenous space. It's about listening to Indigenous people and, you know, I guess having Indigenous people employed, you know, in, in that space is important as well. I think too many times there's, you know, too many um, you know, non-Indigenous people that are in those sort of management roles and um, I think it's important to have Indigenous managers in, in those roles and um, and then just engaging with the communities and, and different Indigenous organisations is, is just as important as well. Yeah. Now, we have a lot of people finding out about their Aboriginality or a lot of young people not knowing which community group they actually belong to but know that they're obviously either they 
label themselves as Indigenous or First Nations person, where would you get them to start looking and exploring? Because many of them want to know but don't know where to start. Yeah, look, it's a great question. And it's um, I get a lot of people reach out to me about, you know, finding out about the Aboriginal heritage, you know, late in life and you know, even the young ones as well. And, and it's always been my advice, you know, do your research, find out who your mob is. You know, there's lots of Aboriginal organisations out there that do have that support. And I know my dad, you know, Gary Murray, he works in that space, you know, cultural heritage. And um, I've, I've referred a lot of people to him to help with, um, you know, I guess, you know, finding their identity out and who their tribes are. And, and I think once you do find out who your mob is, you know, the first step is to engage with the traditional owners, you know, the organisations that, that, you know, that are in that space and, and get involved, get involved in, in the, the organisations, get back on country, you know, connect with your, your family and your elders, you know, because it's just, um, I guess that's where you get your sense of pride and your identity becomes stronger from connecting to country. Yeah. So you've got a daughter and a son or daughters and sons. Um, what's the difference between raising a, a good, healthy Aboriginal girl and a good, a healthy Aboriginal boy? Oh, look, it's um, easier with the boys, harder with the girls. But um, <laughs> you know, in saying that, um, you know, it's, it's our responsibility as parents to you know, pass on our knowledge to, to our, our children and, um, I guess, educate them you know, from a, a cultural sense as well. And, um, you know, like I mentioned, I, I always travel back home, travel back on country and, you know, I always take my kids back home and, and get them to connect to country and, I guess, share the stories that I, I was told, you know, growing up and um, I guess that's how you keep that culture alive and it's, it's you know, just as important, um, you know, sharing those stories but, you know, connecting with family, you know, teaching them about the culture and, you know, the dances and, the language, it's something that, you know, it, I'm still working on that myself and um, I guess being able to teach your children, it helps you as well. Yeah. Um, you, you, in your life, you've been able to travel to many, many places around Australia. Do you actually have a favourite place that you would love to go back to that you've been to? Um, yeah, look, I've, 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 been, I've been lucky. I've travelled you know, overseas a few times. I've been to South Africa and Japan, Ireland, uh, Las Vegas, New York, and LA. Um, you know, it was just, it was great traveling overseas and it just opened my eyes up so much. And you know, I've also been lucky to travel around the country you know, with football and, you know, been to a lot of great places around, around the country. And I think a place that really stands out is, um, you know, I went to Uluru and, um, you know, we camped at the, the Aboriginal community there, Mutachulu, and um, we got to stay with Uncle um, Bob Randall and, um, you know, some of the, the, the elders and community there. And I guess yeah, that, that really opened my eyes. You know, I've been to Tiwi Islands as well. And, um, you know, just some of those remote communities, you know, were some places that, you know, taught me a lot about culture as well. Um, but, you know, my, my favourite place is just always, you know, getting to go back home to Haywood, Lake Condor and, you know, getting to, to go back on country. But, you know, I've always, my advice to all my you know, younger cousins and, and friends and, you know, travel overseas, you know, it, it's a big world out there. There's so much the world can offer offer you and, you know, you, you travel overseas, you go out there, you learn new skills, meet new people and your home is always going to be there and, um, you know, that's something that I, I feel, you know, a lot of our young people need to do is, is, is travel overseas and, you know, travel around the country. It's, it's such an important uh, thing to do. Obviously, you still follow the the, the 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 footy. So, any players we should be looking out for in the next couple of seasons? You reckon? Oh, look, I've, I've had a little bit to do, you know, coaching and and mentoring with um, Jamara Eugle Hagen and uh, Morris Rioli. You know, I remember I got to coach them in the under the under eighteens Laguntas team, and um, you know those guys, those guys, two guys, they just really stood out, and I knew from you know at that young age they were going to be superstars of the AFL and um, you know, I also had a lot to do with Jermaine Jones, who's over at West Coast, and um, yeah. you know, th those three guys. You know, I really believe that you know they're going to be superstars in the AFL. Yeah, um, we've got a couple of last questions for you because I know I know the time. Is um, what advice would you give young Aboriginal people who basically are a bit lost and don't exactly know what to do in their in their future? Yeah, I think, you know, it's about, I guess, finding you know, what your purpose is in life and, you know, what, what makes you happy. Um, 
and then just having that dream and, and setting those goals to achieve it and um, but don't be scared to, to try anything you know like I, I remember you know, in, in high school I wanted to be a PE teacher then you know, I got into football and then I, I wanted to run a record label and then um, you know, I wanted to do sports management and I wanted to do coaching and, and I guess I tried all these different things and you know, I, I feel like I've finally found, you know, what I want to do and I'm running my own business, that, that's important to me, you know, being my own boss and, um, you know, being able to, I guess, you know, put on events to, you know, connect with other people. It's something that, you know, it took me a while to get, you know, I'm 42 now and, you know, it took me a while, but I had to try all these other things to get to where I am. And so, you know, just don't be scared to, to try things. It doesn't matter if you, if you fail, like that, that's how we learn. And, um, you know, just having that, that vision to, you know, follow your dreams and that courage as well. Yep. So, so if I ask you that question, where do you see yourself in five years' time? Oh, look, yeah, you know, I'd, I'd like to travel and, um, you know, focus on my business in the next sort of, you know, two to three years and, I guess, build the business up and, you know, get involved in more bigger and better events and, you know, stuff like that. But, yeah, you know, I'd like to, you know, sometime just, you know, be able to, I guess, travel around the country and, you know, in a bit of a, a van or something and, you know, visit other remote communities, other Aboriginal communities and, you know, just keep learning. And, and you know, that's something that, you know, you can never stop doing is, is learning. And uh, I guess it's, uh, you know, it's something that I've, I've always had a bit of a dream about, you know, just that, that travelling around the country. Yeah, cool. Just watching the time, so now it's really time to go. But my, my final question is what would you like people to walk away with from our bit of a yarn this afternoon? Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's just about, um, you know, that, that learning and, and educating yourself um, to be better. Um, you know, that's something that, you know, I, I, I've had to do my, myself and, you know, it's an important skill to, I guess, you know, to, to teach and educate yourself, you know, in, in different areas. And, um, you know, that, that's something that you know, I've always sort of, you know, talked about and, and also just being able to, to, I guess, follow your dreams. Um, you know, I've mentioned that a few times and, you know, just, yeah. just put it out to the universe and, and you know, it'll, it'll come back and, you know, manifestation and uh, it's always worked for, for myself and you know, it's something that, you know, I, I believe in. Yeah, cool. Now, thanks, Nathan, for joining us. It's a pleasure to, to yarn with you. Um, I want to say to our viewers, please check out the, the next couple of um, Black Yarning episodes that are coming out. So I'll see you guys later and I want to say thanks, Nathan, for joining us. Uh, thanks for having us. Thanks, mate. Talk to you soon. See ya. Bye.